Hi, this is Ian Wright. Um, today I'm going to talk about remote healing, distance healing, non-local healing, that type of thing. And the first thing I want to say is, is um, this is not, uh, there's no claims being made here. This is a discussion of um, principles, practices, a little bit of research, a little bit of trying to understand how it works, my own personal experiences of it. And why am I doing this? I mean, the reason I'm doing this actually um, is I'm treating a variety of people who I was treating hands on and I'm doing hands off treatment and people want to know well, what is all that about and how does that all work? And as with all of these subjects that I'm always discussed, there's it takes probably about 40 minutes to to actually go through some of the principles and the practice and the ideas behind it and also just have an understanding. And with in this particular field, my understanding and my experiences are growing, as they do with every patient, each day. And I'm learning, I write notes every day on principles, processes, practices, and all these different kind of techniques. And so, First of all, who am I? My name's Ian Wright, and I, by practice, I'm an osteopath, and I specialize in cranial pediatric osteopathy, and I've been teaching that around the world for probably 20, 25 years, actually, now. And in doing so, I teach osteopaths, postgraduate osteopaths, to develop their sensory awareness so they can start to feel quite subtle things that are happening in the body, unfolding patterns of physiology where there are potential expressions of health in their body and also where they're feeling things that aren't working quite right, be it blocks or physiological problems, very precise physiological problems, for example, the effects, the effects of bacteria on the body or virus or infection or inflammatory processes and all that and how to feel these as fields of function and I'm going to come back and talk to that. So I've also at the same time for the past say 15 years been teaching non-practitioners, people who are um, from all walks of life, what I would call the dynamics of stillness, which again it's all my stuff is around expanding your sensory development and awareness to really feel um, some of these subtle tides and fluid fields and in nature and also this process of reconnecting with our health and reconnecting with our own internal nature meanwhile exploring our senses and so that's my background to this and I suppose behind it all there's this feeling of developing this felt sense where you feel it's it's beyond normal senses or it's a combination of our senses where we get a feeling sense and that is something that I think comes to the very fore when we're looking at some of this distance work in the particular way that I work there's a lot of different ways of doing distance work and I'm going to talk about those a little bit but I started doing this kind of distance treatments probably gosh 15 years ago when a good friend of mine we'd <clears throat> we'd run a clinic day the daisy clinic at my practice and you know we would treat special needs children and we'd come back to my house and we'd sit by the fire maybe even have a glass of wine and we would do our kind of evening list and our evening list was distance healing where we would treat people internationally, people who we couldn't have access to, people, yeah, who we couldn't have access to at the time. And Mary had a practice, my friend had a practice where we, she'd treat complicated horses and animal things. And we, we'd start working with some of these things, some areas that were having difficulty. And we would, for example, treat my mother-in-law who lives in Italy. And um, she would feel it every time. And what we realised when we were working and doing this together was it's, incredibly precise um, and you can have this huge lens this huge angled lens which I'll talk about a lot later and then when I was as I was traveling more and there were children that needed support who were really in trouble some of these children with special needs I would constantly 
be treating X, Y, Z child to support them when they're going through something very difficult. And so that's the kind of contextual background. Then, in, certainly in the last three months, my practice changed to ones of, of working hands-on, to ones of working hands-off with people. And it was a fascinating transition and it kind of got me into studying it for myself and studying it as in working with every patient and learning and growing with every patient and working how things work. And there's, there's suddenly this whole world, open. I've never had a lesson in this before in my life, but this whole world opened up and it's a, a fascinating thing. And what has happened over the last months is it's like, your skill base has opened up tenfold. You have this incredibly long angle lens or you can slip into this micro, micro physiology or you can slip into the, the huge macro where you're looking at emotional, relational, environmental, ancestral fields and factors with incredible precision and you can jump very quickly between, the t between all these layers. So now, at the moment, funnily enough, when I'm treating friends and family, I actually sit in the couch in the corner and I treat them hands off because I find I'm, I'm, it's more of a precise tool. So it's a very interesting ongoing exploration. But here I'm not going to talk about that so much. I'm going to talk about what the history of this is and what this is all about and where it comes from. And some of the, I mean, how on earth does that work? You know looking at actually principles of how that possibly could function and then I'll just talk about one or two kind of interesting experiences and how they link up with research because you know I, I have a bachelor in science I'm I'm quite science based in my thinking and I need explanations I need understandings I need to prove things I'm always prove, trying to prove something and people who know me in practice I have all well for the last 25 years at least, I've always wanted to choose the most complex cases because I want to prove if it works. Even with hands-on osteopathy, I'm like, give me the hardest case and let's see if this actually does work. <laughs> I'd always be testing it. It's just in my, my nature. So the first thing I suppose to say is, is I'm not discussing osteopathy. I'm, I'm discussing distance healing, you know, um, which is a different thing. So, And there's a history of this distance healing in... Most cultures, most cultures have had this distance energy healing from shamans to intercessory prayers, spiritual healing. Taoism, Buddhism is rich with, have rich veins of this kind of work of non-local healing. Or <clears throat> some of the indigenous tribes with uh, the sh shamans and the bone healers. And I, I spent time in Guatemala with learning interesting things from um, some of the ancient shamanic bone healers there. And, and then there's modern inter interpretations like Reiki and bioenergy and quantum healing. But the common thread between these is this common assumption is distance is not a limiting factor and this is the real key point because it's incredibly hard for when I'm talking to people say well I can treat that from a distance and they're like well hang on <laughs> you're not here <laughs> you know so the thinking behind and the common assumption between these distance healing intention type therapies um, is that distance is not a limiting factor it's non-local and interestingly enough there are more distance healers than any other complementary um, medicine practitioners, you know, in the Western world. You know, there's thousands and thousands of them, for example, in the UK. So, you know, I'm a scientist, but, and I can practice it, I feel I can do this, but it's unclear how it works. And so, but I can feel it. So, we need to look at, let's look at some of the research. And the interesting thing about this type of in, uh, distance healing is it's quite open to research. It's actually researched much more effectively than hands-on healing, actually much more effectively, much more research than surgery even. And I'll go into why, but really it's to do with the idea that you can do a single blind trial. Now, a single blind trial is the patient doesn't know they're having it done, as opposed to a double blind trial when the practitioner and the patient 
don't know it's being done. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. But here you can because you can have a group of people and some people you treat, some people you don't. So there's a lot of analysis. There's a lot of uh, research about it. And just going to talk about some of the little basics here, like uh, Schmidt et al. were a group who did a meta-analysis, They meaning they examined hundreds and hundreds of research projects, including, for example, taking functional MRIs, EEGs, um, heart rate, electrodermal activities, pulse, um, and looked at the effects on distance intentional healing on physiology. And they found there were effects on yeast growth, bacterial growth, direct effects on connective tissue cells, red blood cells, less of an effect shown on cancer cells, unfortunately. Um, and there's work on animals, Re research showing there was a greater heightened recovery from anesthesia, a faster wound healing, for example, in mice. In humans, they did a meta-analysis of over 90 randomized trials. There's a, this is a group called Crawford et al. And they found that distance healing intention therapies had a higher validity than hands-on therapies, meaning a higher positive outcome rate than hands-on ses sessions, which is incredible. When I heard that, I thought, that, wow, that's amazing. Um, so a lot of this analysis and a lot of this kind of single blind research processes showed what would be called in science as proof of principle, meaning it works in principle, but how? How? That's all very well, but how? So, and also the research, even though there's a lot of it, is for me not really adequate. It needs to be more. And it can lead to kind of speculative science. And it and it can that can easily jump into the idea of pseudoscience, and we have to be careful with that. Um, but there was a, a famous quantum physicist who said that thoroughly conscious ignorance is the preclude to all good science. And the neuroscientist Stuart Feierstein out of Columbia University, the neuroscientist said, what we don't know or understand is the beginning of true science. We need to embrace uncertainty. So, I mean, within physics, there are a couple of, the, the idea of non-local action theories. So the idea of, say, quantum entanglement, which is, which is actually what Einstein called the, the weirdest thing in, in, in science. Uh, and he said it was spooky action at a distance. So this is all about two particles acting. One is one side of the world, one is acting the other side of the world. And waves, they function as waves. OK, so this is the idea of waves and particle theory. So what happens is... A wave has all possibilities of movement, okay? It can move in any direction, okay? And everything has a wave and a particle essence to it. So when something, when these, part, when these waves are observed, they become a particle in terms of function and they take up a certain rotation or a certain movement, say they move like this. Now, the... Interesting thing is the particle, the other side of the world, the kind of twin particle, will move in the opposite direction. So there is no such thing as space. Space is an irrelevancy or there are quantum coherence. So there is a coherence in movements without this idea of space. And, and it's only in I suppose modern physics where you start to get this idea that space is possibly a concept for us and it leads you into interesting thinking and the interesting thing for me is it does take a kind of quantum leap of thinking to go well hang on <laughs> how can you affect something you know that's the other side of the world you know <laughs> tomorrow for example I, I have a, a patient booked in who's in Perth Australia wow and the um you know and the phone line goes down <laughs> but actually I say it doesn't matter we can we can still feel because it's it's more direct which is 
you know, it's incredible, really. Um, so let's talk about this idea of placebo, because placebo is a key element in this. And I'm going to play around with this idea of placebo because it's kind of interesting. I, I find it very interesting, placebo. Because it's the idea in medicine, you know, the simplest way is you give a kind of dead pill with no active ingredients. And so some people will get the dead pill, others get the actual pill. And the research is, is well, will the people who don't get the active ingredient pill, do they report changes in their physiology or in how they feel, et cetera, et cetera. And it shows that in quite a large percentage of cases, depending on which research, uh, and they've done this with you know blood pressure pills to um, antidepressants, all different medications actually, and there's a huge body of research about placebo, placebo which is fascinating. And it shows that it actually is relevant. And this placebo effect is hugely important in medicine. Now, one explanation of the placebo is belief. If you believe in something, it's the kind of, I suppose, probably one of the key explanations of placebo is if someone believes in something, this pill, if I believe this pill is going to help, say, with my blood pressure and I take it, it has an effect because belief <clears throat> can have an effect on our physiology. And we all know that actually how we feel is very important. Um, but <laughs> if you, when you do single blind trials, single blind trials, as I've said, are to do with the patient, say in this situation, the patient had not knowing if they're taking the pill or if they're, they aren't taking the pill. And as I said, distance healing has a great opportunity because you can do that very easily. Um, you can't do it very easily with hands-on treatment because you know you're getting treatment. Now you can give scam treatments, but you're still engaging with someone. So it doesn't really make sense or incredibly difficult to research surgery. So you don't have single blind trials that are very effective in surgery because you I suppose you could open someone up and close them and people have done that and not do what you need to do and see if that helps, but you're still engaging with them in a different way. Now, it's much cleaner researching so someone who, when you're doing distance healing, you either do something or you don't, and they don't know. It's the same as giving a pill almost. So that's why the research is so much better. Di double blind, you, as I said, you can't do. So is belief part of the positive effects of distance healing. Well, I'm going to tell you a couple of funny stories about that, which kind of make you think, because um, I'm always the scientist, I'm always testing it. So I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about patients. I'm going to talk about a, one friend and one member of my family, because they're interesting cases. And the first one is my cousin, and um, she has a marked um, MS, and she lives in England. And whenever I'm close, whenever I'm there, I've gone and I've treated her, you know, and it's not, you know, you're not expecting a miracle, but I'm hoping that she'll feel a little bit better, you know, a little bit more energy, a little bit more something. Um, and, I, and I've treated her on many occasions. And, you know, she says, Ian, that did nothing. <laughs> She's very straight. She's very down the line with me. And, I, you know, there's me thinking, you know, I can help. No. So, you know, a few weeks ago, um, six weeks ago or something, um, you know, I, I find out that uh, she's, you know, she's, she's by herself, she's quite, um, you know, she, she, she's needing a lot of support, it's quite, you know, uh, marked, and she'd had a fall, and she, she wasn't able to walk, kept falling over, and uh, had double vision. So I rang her up, and I said, listen, let me, let me try, let me treat you, <laughs> and the interesting thing, this could, the, the interesting reason why I'm talking about this is I'm like doing a it's almost a double blind if you think of it in terms of belief. Number one, she doesn't believe I can help. And number two, from my history of treating, I'm thinking, well, I ain't going to do anything, Laura. Uh, so it's almost double blind in a strange kind of way. Neither of us believed in it. So, so I thought, look, I'll have a go. So I gave her a treatment and, you know, the, you know, the, the double vision obviously got better within an hour and she could walk again for a while. It didn't last, but it lasted for a couple of weeks, you know, and now she rings me back and, you know, I back it up. But 
something, something. No miracle, no cure, but something, you know, and very interesting. The other one is, uh, you know, I've been treating people, I've been working with people with, you know, lots of different kind of conditions. For example, at the beginning of this, I was doing a lot, treating a lot of babies who had, say, nasty reflux. Lots of that, because that's what I do. I spend a lot of time, my time treating babies and nasty reflux or colic and, you know, screaming the place down. It's really my field is, is, is the paediatrics. And, um, you know, and in a lot of cases, there was reports of progress and very much so. And um, that's an interesting thing for me is, you know, OK, if you're looking at placebo, is placebo, does the baby believe in me? No, maybe it's because the mother believes in me. I'm not sure, you know, actually, you know, maybe you can affect the physical, you know, not just sort of emotional or stress or all that kind of stuff. No, very much. No, I treat incredibly physical things. So another f brings me to another one, which is, I think, quite funny is um, a good friend of mine had showed me on his on the on the video. He's, he'd ripped his hand and, you know, doing some outdoor activity and, uh, you know, he clearly ripped a tendon, the upper neurosis of a tendon. And I said to him, you know, I think you just need, need to go and see a hand, a hand surgeon. I think that's, you know, that's a trouble. You know, you should immediately go because there might be a chance of saving that tendon. And uh, I said, I'll tell you what, though, <laughs> let me let me just have a go at that. You know, and, and uh, he texts me the next morning, goes, what the is going on? That's you know, <laughs> incredible. So you're thinking, wow, you can really, how can a non-physical thing have, affect the physical? I don't know, um, but that's that's the, the the kind of what we're getting here. So, what am I doing? What am I doing when I'm doing this? Is this the kind of this is my more of a personal thing? And again, this whole through, I'm making no claims that I can help people here, but I'm just going through experience and, and talking about the idea of the principles, the practice, the thoughts behind it. That it's not just coming out of nowhere. That's really what I'm trying to say. So, what do I do? I'm not. I'm not a Reiki person. I'm not sending light. I'm not sending healing. I'm all about feeling actually what's going on. I'm very about being extremely precise. So I'm not visualizing. No, because I, I'm always not into visualizing when I'm teaching people. It's nothing to do with visualization. You want to feel it. You want to feel what's going on. And as I say, I'm, I, anyone who knows me, I'm in the, I have to get the most complex cases are the ones I'm interested in. And, but it's being precise as to exactly where and how this body is compromised and allowing a process to change. That's really all I'm doing. So, as I said, you know, you, we're looking at these fields and in some of the other work I've been talking about, you're talking about these fluid fields and interacting fields and feeling these fields and each, each field has a certain qualitative, you know, a, a fluid field of someone who has an inflammatory process has a certain quality, a felt sense, and you can teach people to feel that with their hands, but you can feel it without. Bacterial infection, etc. Emotions have huge different, um, they feel different, different emotions feel different. And actually, we all know this. This isn't anything, we know if we're with someone who feels sad or feels angry, we can feel it. Everyone can, you know, I'm not doing anything that is any different. It's just bringing your attentional awareness to certain things. And from that, looking at things in completely different ways, you know, this distance gives you this almost this long lens where you, you can see bigger patterns like emotional, relational, ancestral, environmental. How's this person in this in the environment? And you can start to see things. And so, but then you can get down to extreme precise on the micro, micro, and you can move between the two. Anyway, but that is a, it's a huge subject that, um, and I'm going to, actually, I've decided I want to teach practitioners this because it's a really important thing to learn to be able to do. And it's just almost pulling back a veil in your own head as to being able to do this for practitioners out there. Um, and to teach people to do it. I, ha I am doing some teaching, actually, where I'm te doing three-way course pe um, sessions. So, you know, that's the wonderful thing about modern Zoom, etc. You can have 
you know, the patient here in one country, you can have a practitioner in another country and me in another country, and I can support them as they go through this process of, I mean, it's the modern world, it's, it's crazy really, but it's, but it's great fun. Um, and, but I was working out, right, okay, I, I've got, gosh, about 20 chapters of an online course here, which would be really actually very interesting to do. But unfortunately, I worked out that the first time I'll be able to work on, on that will be exactly 12 months time, because I've got a series of courses I have to finish. I've got my cranial paediatrics parts two and three, and I've got an advanced in cranial practice course and a course on universal compassion practice, which I really want to do. So it'll have to be something like 2021 20, September before we do some sort of dynamic distance healing practitioners course. But it's also for practitioners I would do it because you need a huge precision in terms of anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, and, and most importantly, kind of developing this felt sense. So it's an interesting subject. And, you know, for me, it's, it's about we can, there's much more open to us um, than we realise. And it's almost like pulling veils back and suddenly learning to feel and you know, I don't, I don't think I'm some gifted healer. I think this is just something we can learn, frankly. And it's just about pulling back the veils, almost. Anyways, I hope that's been helpful. Um, next time, which uh, possibly next Sunday or maybe a little later, um, depending on where I am, um, but follow uh, this Facebook page, uh, Dynamics of Stillness, to, um, I'm going to do... A talk about this really I think very important to me um, course that I, I, I'm putting together actually it's just it's been done um, which is about restoring peace through this anxiety breaks work which is to do with very focused precise practices which I've never seen done before and I've spent the last two years working on this and it was for a book but I decided that actually it's better if I talk it through with people. I, I think a book is, is not because I was actually heading towards getting it published and I thought, no, actually, I'm going to do this as a course because I think it will reach people better. And it's about really literally rewiring your brain because the brain the, the, the brain and anxiety has a certain neuro pathways that have become sensitized. They actually grow um, in different ways. And it's about literally repatterning the brain, very focus specific practices, which I'm really excited about because anxiety is huge now. And even if it's just feeling us feeling low level of anxiety some of the time to, you know, mark severe anxiety disorders. And I've spent many years working with anxiety from young children to obviously people who are very old. And it's, for me, it's one of the most important things we can do is get people out of anxiety into a place of peace where they can just allow their brains to reset and develop a practice where they can really come to a place where they're quiet and calm because actually living with anxiety is incredibly difficult for people you know and it's an unseen thing you know it isn't like this is a sore arm you know it's it's internal but the pain is can be more and so for me that's very important so i'm going to talk about that um very soon possibly even next sunday and uh, that'll be quite a long talk because there's a lot of stuff in that um with regards to being in contact with me, um, with regards to um, healing stuff, um, dynamics of stillness at gmail.com. You can, you can email me with uh, questions or thoughts about it, but um, distance healing is, it, it's something else. And it's like, you know, I, in the last three months, it's been fantastic because my whole way of being and way of doing things has completely changed. And I find it incredible that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the same room as, as a member of a friend or family and like, I know I'll treat you hands off. Yeah. But then actually people who, who know me in, in, at the Daisy Clinic, you know, I'm, I'm sort of standing in the corner and directing stuff anyway. So and I've always used that kind of sensory awareness stuff. So um, it's interesting. And the science, you know, this this idea of quantum entanglement, quantum coherence, they're nice in theory. But how does that actually link up? There's a little gap between this idea and this, you know, and so, you know, there's research that shows it's effective, but actually, you know, a proof of theory, but actually connecting them up would be very, very interesting. And, um, you know, any researchers out there, I'm happy to research. <laughs> so I wish you well. 
and um, I'll be speaking to you soon.